When you choose a technology for your product, you can Google it, you can find lots of tutorials, lots of articles on nitty-gritty details, and then you can find big companies using some of those technologies to run their apps. But what is missing quite often is something you can relate to, something where you can see, oh, this is not a big company, this is just a, uh, another small company like us, small team like us, someone who did use some of the technologies that are, because all of them proclaim that they're the best thing ever invented, but you don't really know until you start doing it. So what I want to share today is our experience building the product, building our app using Closure Script and React Native, and how it worked for us, and maybe this will help drive your technology decision um, in your product. And to set the scene, I will just give a quick background uh, where I come from. So uh, I live in Azerbaijan. It's a small post-Soviet country that you may not have heard of. So this is where we are right now. Uh, this is the country itself. So it's about four times smaller than Poland and a little bit less snowy. <laughs> and about 10 million people. <clears throat> and like most post-Soviet countries, uh, we went from having almost no technology in 80s and early 90s to having a lot of technology inundated with smartphones, with high-speed internet, ubiquitous 3G. And this, is the, this has derived a lot of adoption uh, of technology. And especially internet services are growing really fast. And in our country, we run equivalent of classifieds. Depending on where you come from, you may have heard of Avito, OLX, or Craigslist. And we run similar website uh, in country. It's one of the most popular websites in country. And if you have used any of those services, you will immediately recognize it's a platform to buy and sell uh, stuff online. And we are, because of that technology adoption, because of that growth, uh, we are also growing very rapidly. And in the last 18 months, as we uh, grew almost six times from, well, depending if you count unique users on sessions, but basically we went from having 300,000 monthly visitors to one and a half million last January. So this puts a lot of pressure on your product. It's, uh, it drives your design, design decisions. And at the same time, we are still a small team uh, that needs to manage all this growth and has limited, has limited resources. So you have to pick your battles. At the same time, uh, the problem with the reason I mentioned jumping from no technologies to a lot of technologies is that uh, in those cases, uh, we te you tend to skip over a few generations. So I think for the last few years, we have noticed this trend that people were accessing more and more uh, our services for mobile. And this is a global trend, obviously, but uh, for us, it's even more skewed towards uh, mobile because a lot of people just skipped computers completely and using uh, smartphones as their main device. So as you can see, more than 70% people access it, uh, our websites from uh, mobile devices. And for a long time, we've thought, that's all right. Why not? We have a good desktop website. We had a good mobile website. Uh, we focus on making sure the experience is fluid on any type of device. But at some point, I started to realize that it's not enough just having a mobile website. People demand you to have a website, to have an app. People complain that you don't have an app. People expect you to have an app. And apart from other things, it leaves a space for competition to come in and use the opportunity and hit you in the weakest spot. So by the time we reached about a million, we were closing to reaching about a million users, monthly users, we decided that we need to get serious about this whole mobile app thing. But at the same time, uh, really, we're a small team, so we had to find a solution that is workable for us. We can't afford building separate teams for iOS and Android. We can't afford spending too much time because we still need to manage all that goes for the website itself and at the same time build an app. So key criteria for us were that we should be able to launch and iterate really quickly, and uh, we should try to avoid uh, having separate code bases for iOS, for Android, keep them as much as possible close together. And uh, we really wanted to avoid introducing another two languages in our technology stack, in this case, Objective-C or Java, or at least keep them to the minimum contained. So 
but we also wanted to, as I say, uh, eat the cake and have it. So at the same time, we also wanted to have a native app. We wanted it to behave natively. We wanted it to have access to native features like push notifications, uh, GPS, camera, whatever, uh, that you have limited access, still have limited access for regular websites. So uh, with that, uh, we decided, uh, we, we started looking at all the alternatives available, uh, solutions available, and between having a website and a proper native app, there are sort of 50 different variations of hybrid apps. Uh, everyone understands different things, so I'm not going to go into semantic debate what is hybrid app, but basically anything that isn't fully native, uh, we, I would consider hybrid for the purpose of this talk. So what we wanted, we wanted to get as much as possible to right side, uh, being close to native app without actually going native. Um, and in, uh, instead of uh, trying every option on the market, it's impossible, we tried to uh, focus on two or three things that we understand, that we have some sort of experience with, and uh, choose from them. So just very quickly, you, you always have an option just to do a website wrapper, just wrap it in native shell, call it a day, launch it. The main advantage is you get a desktop, uh, you get a screen uh, icon on the phone screen of users, and it's not to be underestimated for a lot of people. This is how they get to access your web services. And at the same time, it looks like it would be the same experience. Why not? They already have a mobile website. It will be the same, just like with the icon. But actually, it's worse because people have different expectations from the apps. So if you have an app, it's expected that it will be more fluid. It's expected that it will be easier to use. And it wouldn't be the same, just like a web app. So expectations are higher, so the uh, customer satisfaction goes down. Second option, and it was particularly available for us because we use Ruby on Rails on backend, uh, was going sort of semi-native. And this approach is particularly popularized by folks from Basecamp with their product Turbolinks. I'm not sure how many of you know about that, but what it does, it allows you to easily integrate web use into your native shell. But as opposed to the first version where you just have a wrapper, the important components uh, that are critical for your app, you would write uh, natively. But then all of the rest of the app runs from the, web, from the website, so it shares a lot of code uh, from what you, with what you already have. But for us, it didn't work because we still needed to know, we still needed to have dedicated Android and iOS people for that. Uh, but it's a good option to mention, nevertheless. Uh, for many cases, this is, a very, this is a very convenient option of getting up and running quickly. Uh, one thing to note is, again, compared to purely native, you still have this full round trip for every request because you have to access, because the rendering itself is happening on the server, and on a slower network, you start to feel it, and although it is, all, it is quite like semi-native, that's why I call semi-native, it's not as fluid as it could be. So which brought us uh, to the point um, that I'm going to discuss in detail. So it's going almost native, what I call, uh, and there are again a bunch of options available here like React Native, Native Script, Zamarin, I don't know any of those uh, to be honest, except for React Native, just mentioning them for completeness. Um, but there are a number of options that allow you to actually uh, use native components, so you actually run a native app, uh, but you get to use the same tools that you already know. Uh, you already know and you have some sort of experience with, and you get to share a lot of code between your apps. So um, we decided that we should try it a spin. And, and also, yeah, importantly, uh, we'll get to that point in detail later on. It allows you to update your app without going to the App Store as frequently as you would otherwise. So uh, as you can guess, uh, we used React Native. Uh, there are a few reasons about it, but most importantly, we already knew React. We already used it for some of our apps. We had very good experience. And they got good stories supporting both iOS and Android. So a mature ecosystem. We had lots of libraries. And so we thought, well, we should, give it, we should try it. And it's very easy to get started. So it's easy to experiment. So we thought, let's experiment and see where it takes us. And obviously, you get to code in JavaScript, which is well, we'll get to that. So um, very quickly, if you haven't used React Native, uh, this getting started is extremely easy. You just run a few commands. 
and init your app, and in five minutes you have something running. And I, well, don't underestimate the importance of that. Being able to run something on your device in five minutes or on an emulator is an extremely satisfying thing. You, have a, you generate a code, you get an app, you change something, it immediately changes. It's a, that short feedback loop that reminds uh, about how 20 years ago when the whole web thing started and you had active server pages, you did a cycle uh, for loop and you render some HTML and it's great, right? And it's almost the same feeling, right? So you don't know anything about the apps. You have never developed an app before. You have never seen any piece of Objective-C or Java, yet you already have something running. So uh, that allows you to iterate very quickly. And uh, because of that, uh, the cost of experimentation is very low. And you, can, uh, so, and, and you can move quickly. So this is a code that it generates. And as you can see, it's pretty simple. It's a bunch of reports, a few uh, style sheets, and then the React uh, component that actually does the rendering. And if you did use any of the React, uh, React regular or React native, uh, even without going native, you would re recognize the same pattern. So you have. Uh, components. In this case, it's a view container that contains a text component that renders a string. And um, React does all of the heavy lifting to actually make sure it happens. And to, for layout and for styling, you use something similar to CSS. Uh, and as I said, you can quickly change styles, you can add text, you can add variables, you can uh, do your normal programming stuff, and you can immediately see it on your device. So this is cool, uh, in a way, and the important part is, I mentioned before, I think, but anyway, just in case, so the components themselves are native. You get a fully native experience, but it's orchestrated by JavaScript, right? So what is shown where, how it interacts with, with a user, this is controlled by JavaScript. But the components themselves, this is not an emulation. Those are real uh, components, native components, both on Android and uh, iOS. You can have your custom components that are not native, but that's your choice. So uh, this is kind of cool, but uh, it's JavaScript, right? Uh, so which kind of sucks. <laughs> um, and I know for many people, uh, JavaScript is a default language that they love and use all the time. But I also know that for a lot of other people, this isn't the best language. Uh, it has got its own quicks and whats, and you've got uh, lots of uh, problems with standard library. And kind of generally, um, it, it isn't, we use Ruby on the back end. And every time we had to go to the front end code, it kind of feels like downgrade of the experience. But clearly, this isn't related to React Native in any way. We already had this when we've been doing React development on the web. So, and we have uh, sort of solved it uh, by adopting ClojureScript. Now, um, you can ask why ClojureScript, why not Elm, why not a bunch of other languages, and this would be purpose of another talk, but just some, to summarize, it's a modern, beautiful language once you get over the parentheses. And uh, it's got immutability and concurrency at its core, as its core concepts, which help you develop applications rapidly and more reliably. And it embraces using data structures as a, again, a kind of rich set of data structures as a, one of its core concepts. And it enables uh, best-in-class interactive development with hot code reloading. Now, you have that already in React land, in a JavaScript land, but ClojureScript sort of pioneered the current state of the art, and I think it's still quite ahead uh, compared to what you have in a typical JavaScript. And you get to use Lisp, right? So you can mention smart words like homo iconicity next time you talk to someone, so why not? Uh, I actually highly recommend there is a talk. Oops called Closure Script for Skeptics. And this is a great talk uh, by Derek, uh, I'm not sure how to write pronounce Derek Stager. So it's a great talk that shows you why you wouldn't be too crazy using Closure Script as it can look from the outside, that it's actually a great language and it does a great job at explaining its ben benefits of using it over JavaScript. I will, however, shamelessly steal one slide from his talk. Uh, and this is uh, qu quite often uh, the problem with syntax of un unusual language comes from unfamiliarity rather than from inherent complexity of the language. 
And what he did, he showed this uh, slide to, I think, a couple of hundred JavaScript developers saying this is ClojureScript, right? And some of you who use ClojureScript would probably know that this isn't a ClojureScript. This is actually ES6, valid ES6 with the sprinkles of ES7. But because it looks complicated, it's unusual even for JavaScript, uh, immediate reaction would be, oh, no, that, that, that's something. That's scary. That's, that's, that, that can't be good. And uh, the point he was trying to make here is quite often scare of the syntax is about unfamiliarity. And if you look, actually, if you dig deeper, it's objectively, closure script is objectively a very simple language in terms of its concept. Speaking of simplicity, uh, another talk I highly recommend, nothing to do with closure, uh, exactly with closure, but it's about uh, simple made easy by Rich Hickey, a regional developer of Clojure, which explains um, the difference between uh, simplicity and easiness. And this is the best talk you can watch uh, once you relax after Lambda days. I highly recommend uh, watching this talk. It will make you a better programmer. Uh, it explains those concepts very... Uh, in, 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 I, mean, I watched it a few times, and I highly recommend it to everyone to do that. The, the main, uh, spoiler alert, the main concept is easy isn't the same as simple. So for half of this room, I guess, uh, Polish language is very easy, right? You've been fluently talking it since age seven, maybe. Uh, for me, Polish is extremely hard because I don't know anything. Uh, I, I can't speak Polish. But obviously, it, uh, this is subjective measure, right? So it cannot be at the same time easy and hard. It's, it's because it's relative. If you want to judge the complexity of the language, you have to look at its grammar rules, its inflect ways to inflect it, and all sorts of things. And then you can object come to objective conclusion whether it's simple or complex language. Same with programming languages. And uh, let's see on the real example of very simple component of a closure script component. I just want to illustrate the theme here. Uh, the component, uh, uh, this is a code. Uh, in the bottom, it's what it renders. It's a very simple function that just renders some JavaScript. And if you, uh, if you notice, uh, what it, this function returns is actually an array or vector, as we call it in ClojureScript. So this is a common theme with ClojureScript and Clojure. You use simple, small functions to manipulate data structures. Right? That's almost all of your code should be about that, so manipulating data structures converting from one data structure to another, and using data structure to enable interaction with customer. So uh, th those actual are examples not from React Native. That's from uh, regular uh, React. So for the, for the web, I'm using that to demonstrate how it works after on React Native. And uh, then another component uh, for the, from the reagent. Again, it's a wrapper for React in ClojureScript. Uh, Again, you have a small function here, counting component. And the second theme that is very common in developing ClojureScript apps, uh, based on React at least, is you have a global state. In this case, it's a click counter that holds the state of the application. Everything else is dependent on that state. So your state uniquely defines where, uh, how your app should be rendered right now in particular moment in time. So, in ClojureScript, what we do, uh, we then mutate this state. Uh, and this is a controlled mutation, so it doesn't break the immutability. Uh, so you actually get a new version of that state. And then everything else we renders automatically. And by going back and forth within the state, you can get time travel and everything. But I, go, I won't go to, into the details too much. This, was, this is just to illustrate the point. Now, if we want to apply this to React Native and we want to build an app, uh, it's actually extremely similar to React Native. Uh, it's, we use Renatal. Uh, this is a great uh, wrapper that does all the heavy lifting of connecting React Native. The same four commands, and again, in five minutes, you are up and running. You are up and running. It's a bit more interactivity in the default case. Uh, but uh, the important bit, again, you, are, you can develop uh, very quickly, you can get it up and running, you can change the code, and we use FigWheel uh, for hot code reloading, so immediately as you type in any change, you save the file, and before you move your eyes to the emulator, it's already showing you the new version. Now, uh, I wanted to compare the code with 
React, pure React native, so I dumped it down a little bit back to the same version. And this is what you get. And if you notice again, it's also very similar. You've got a couple of imports, you've got style sheets, and you've got a component that renders the function, that renders uh, the actual uh, um, view. Uh, the big difference here, uh, you don't have uh, custom classes, objects, or anything. Again, just small functions and data structures. If you have noticed on React Native example, style sheet was a class. Uh, so it's, got, it's a class with its special behavior, whereas here it's a hash, or map, as we call it in Clojure. It's just the hash of the, uh, of the data, and you can, you, you can use this hash then in your function that renders another data structure. In this case, it's a view container which contains text container. So if you compare them side by side, uh, this is on top of it is a React Native version, a JavaScript version, uh, and the bottom is ClojureScript version. Uh, so in the first case, you have a class that uh, returns component that's got a render function which returns uh, JSX, which is then transformed uh, to, which helps you to, for, with your markup. Whereas in ClojureScript version, you just have a data structure and a function that returns data structure. And you, you may think why it's important, uh, what's wrong with uh, going the other route. The important bit is, with data structures, you have all of the power of your language to manipulate this data structure. So for instance, if you have a style sheet and you want to do SCSS-like things, like mix-ins, imports, you have all of that already in the language. You have loops, you, have, uh, any, uh, you can use any function that you already use and know without learning extra language to manipulate that. And same applies to any other data structure. So in this case, it will be uh, the actual markup for, the, for your app. So uh, actually, the way I like to reframe the question quite, uh, I read it some, once, that is instead of asking why ClojureScript, ask yourself why JavaScript, right? Uh, if you have, because what happened, those concepts are moving from ClojureScript world, not only from ClojureScript, from other functional language to JavaScript. You've got immutable JS, uh, for instance, that you, you've got uh, lots of libraries that allow you to functionally program the way you are, we are used to in a more functional languages. But once you loaded all that into your language, into your uh, app, you may, you may ask yourself, why am, why am I doing that? Why, why not make a final jump and go, and go to the language that embraces all of those concepts internally? And this is a very liberating experience. I highly recommend everyone to try it. So we played with that a little bit. We decided this is good enough. We created a small prototype. And we thought this is good enough to bet on the technology. Uh, and we, uh, we, we, are, we added another in, uh, person to the team. It's a great engineer who had experience with doing uh, ClojureScript and React Native. And uh, we. In, uh, started working, starting working on making an actual app. So I'll show you a quick demo just so that you, you can see uh, what is it that you can build uh, with a very con small, with a small team. Uh, it took us three months to build, although first and that includes mockups, designs, uh, backend API, and everything. And we don't have any native code at all, so everything that uh, is running in Clojure is developed in Clojure Script except for like some configuration and libraries, some specific things that you have still to go into the, but I can't call it native code. It's a configuration mostly. Uh, so this is an app, and I think it should play. Oops. Is it not playing? Ah, oh, it is playing. <laughs> it's not playing on my screen. So basically, you've got a bunch of things like endless scroll of listings. You have search and filter. You've got specific per category fields. You've got photo gallery with zooming. Uh, you've got bookmarks. You've got native share dialogue. You've got ability to post your own thing, take pictures. You have ability to switch languages. I'm not sure at which stage it is over there. Uh, so save bookmarks and uh, watch them later on. Basically, all of the things you need in your, typ in your typical app, I mean, it's not a base camp, obviously, in terms of complexity, uh, but uh, it is, the important part here is, however small an app is, however 
small product, the first version of your product is it has got to be fast, it's got to be fluid, it's got to be the same for both platforms, and it shouldn't be a hassle to support. So we were able to achieve that, and if there is one takeaway that you want to do, take from this talk, is that you can do that. We did that, and while not painless, it's a very rewarding experience, and I recommend everyone to go in the same route. Now, uh, I'll take, I'll, obviously I can't show you how we build an app up uh, in, in the kind of boundaries of this talk, but I kind of want to focus on a few examples that you need to take care of uh, when building your product. Because first version can take you not three months, but three weeks to develop, right? It's, it doesn't look too complicated, but it's small details that you have to take care of, of uh, to produce a good final product. And uh, for instance, um, you, here you see a list of products and you've got a, uh, you click on it and you op it opens up a product. In a normal web app, uh, if it's not a single page application, what you do uh, when you click on an app, it loads another page. And this pattern is quite often replicated by, by apps. So when you, op when you click on a product, it fires request, it gets JSON, and it renders it on the screen. But if you look, so it's normal, right? Uh, typical that behavior, but we can do better. We can do better. If we look at the screen, we already, in the listing of the products, you already have a name, you already have a price, you already have a photo. So why not render that? So you have, you've got all of the power of React. You've got a partially complete, you, you've got a state which holds the data. Uh, so you can already populate this state uh, of another screen uh, with data that you have while requesting new data from the network. Uh, so this is much better already. When, when you click on it, when you click on the product, you already have something and it, it renders additional data. But we can do even better. And that's not a rocket science. I'm, the only reason I'm mentioning it is because I've seen so many apps not do those simple things. Uh, when, you receive, when we request initial list of products, uh, the actual data in a specific product is very small. It's just a couple of, a few lines of text, it's a contacts, and it's a list of, full list of images. So why not send that at the same time? So instead of getting a small subset of data in a the list, then clicking getting a full data of the product, we just send everything. Obviously it increases your payload, but the payload increase is such a small cost to pay uh, for such a great improvement in interactivity that you should, I mean, it was obvious choice to us. Uh, so we did it, and I hope you were able to see on the demo, I couldn't see it myself right now, uh, that it actually does work uh, pretty smoothly. And we still fire additional requests, because if you scroll down, it shows you related products, it shows you some additional metadata, but that is below the fold. You can do that in the background, so you're actually your users don't notice that anything is happening. And the same example uh, uh, with uh, showing list of categories and then list of subcategories, and each of the subcategories has got its own, its own subset of uh, filters, its own type of uh, products. Again, what I often see is you click on the list and it loads it, your sublist, you click on the sublist, it loads your next level. But if we take the whole tree and download it once when you open an app, when you initialize it, and you cache it there, it's like additional 20, 30 kilobytes uh, of data, but then the whole experience of using an app, as I said before, is much more fluid. And then you can update that cache in the background, and your custom, your users never notice that something's happened. They just always see uh, it working immediately for them. Now, um, there are lots of more small details like that. Uh, uh, there are lots of things you have to care about to achieve good performance, particularly uh, animations. For animations, uh, because they are controlled by JavaScript thread, you have to be really careful not to do any additional computation at the same time, otherwise it starts uh, visibly uh, lagging, not delivering 60 frames per second. And then you have to always uh, take care of how you uh, consume memory so that you don't get out of memory errors in uh, smaller devices, so you don't load too much data in your memory. Uh, there are limits to what you can do, but we have been able to reach pretty good uh, performance on Android and iOS. But that's only part of the equation, right? So you, you will build an app, and then it has got to get its data from somewhere. And you can say that, well, you can use JSON, right? 
You can send a request, uh, get a JSON, parse it, and you're done. Now, you would be right. You can do that, of course, and it works. Uh, but JSON is like JavaScript. It's got um, its limitations. So its spec is tiny, which is great. But also, JSON, its spec is tiny, which isn't so great. If you have ever tried to uh, pass a date or a set uh, over uh, while using JSON, you know what I mean, right? You have to serialize it, and you have to you have to invent your own kind of way of processing because the standard by the JSON by itself doesn't support it. So, uh, from the same people who developed Clojure, we have this format called transit format, and. Just like uh, Clojure works on top of JVM and Clojure Script works, works on top of JavaScript, uh, Transit is sort of a hosted format. I'm not sure if you can use that term. But basically, it works on top of uh, JSON or Message Pack, if you use it for binary communication. And it uh, gives you full flexibility in supporting any data type. Lots of built data types of built-in. Anything that you would need a typical app is already there. Uh, but also, uh, you can have your custom types that are specific for, you to, uh, for your application if you really want to. It's completely language agnostic, so you can use it for your, uh, I don't know, Angular app communicating to your Django backend, right? And, and uh, it's language agnostic. It's got implementations in all of the mainstream, a few official implementations and a bunch of unofficial implementations, I think, for almost any language. And it also allows you arbit arbitrary keys, not just strings. So basically, you get, the way I like to say is you get all of the benefits of the uh, JSON without all, its, all, of, all of its drawbacks. And, so for, and for us, it was particularly useful because we use Ruby in the backend. And idiomatic Ruby, when uh, defining hashes, uses symbols uh, as a key. And the same in Clojure. Idiomatic Clojure quite often uses keywords. Uh, in, as a key for the maps. And um, so this is, uh, these both are the types that evaluates to themselves. So instead of having a bunch of keys, uh, the s uh, strings having the same value, you just use a keyword. And if we had used JSON, we either have to somehow manually, again, process this scenario, or we had to go to the lowest common denominator and use strings uh, instead of uh, keywords and symbols. But with transit, we don't need to worry because those map directly one to one, and we get to use idiomatic way of writing code both in Ruby and Clojure without worrying of how they are represented in transit. So, transit format works. It's uh, extremely easy to use. You just kind of connect your library and almost uh, don't worry about it uh, after that. And you can use it everywhere. You can well, you use JSON. Because it builds on top of JSON, you can reuse existing high-performance um, parsers. And you can use it in the browser, as opposed to like there are lots of other formats that claim the same benefits, but you don't have the parsers in the browser, if you are, because in the browser, you only have JSON. When you build on top of JSON, you have all of those benefits. You don't lose all of those benefits. So well, we have an app. Uh, we have a backend API. We communicate via using transit. But then uh, you need to update. You need to update your apps, right? And if you have ever, ever had to deal with app stores, especially Apple's app stores, you know that it, it's, a, it's an awful experience, right? Granted, it's much better now. You have to wait only three days, not three weeks, uh, to get your app approved. Uh, but the uh, but you still have to wait. You still have to go through this complicated process. And users may not then update your app on the device. And then you lose reviews, because at least in Apple, in Apple land, you only, by default, see the reviews of the last version. So because of all of those problems, developers tend to accumulate multiple changes and push them in one go. And, but when we, if you think about it, when uh, we think about it, in the first version, option that we consider it, where it's a wrapper for the website. When you open that kind of app, it's always up to date, right? It downloads JavaScript, HTML, CSS, images from the web, and you don't need to update or anything. It's always up to date. But we also have JavaScript here, right? It gets compiled. Our code is in JavaScript. So maybe we can do the same. And it turns out the answer is yes. We can do the, sa we can do the same. And uh, for anything that is, doesn't affect binary, 
of your app, so, and most features don't. You, uh, you fix a bug, you change a label, you add some additional functionality. You don't need to go uh, to App Store. Uh, we use a server called Code Push. Uh, it's from Microsoft, by the way. Uh, and it's a free service for now, uh, so it's kind of zero cost of trying to uh, experiment with it. Basically, you just register an SDK. When you're ready, you compile your app, you push an update to the server, and then you have to, in your app, you have to make a couple of decisions uh, when to download and to apply an update. And in our first version, we didn't do a good job. Uh, we would download app in the background and then apply it immediately. And what happened quite often, you would be in the middle of your user flow, like typing a text for your new posting, and then boom, your app has reloaded. So now we're a little bit more smart about it, and you've got complete control. It's just, again, control, fully controlled by your code. So for instance, you can say, download it only over Wi-Fi, or I don't care, download it over 3G. Or you may want to ask user, do you want to download? So it's all choice is yours, and the same how to apply it. So what we found is a good, a good pattern is to uh, apply after some certain amount of inactivity, or when a user leaves the app and then comes back, uh, reloads it, basically, so exits an app, full exits an app, then on the next run, it will be up to date. So it gives you with that very short feedback loop, just similar to web apps, and with code push, you have a, a full control into uh, you can see all of your deployments, you can see adoption percentage, you can roll back if things go wrong. Uh, basically, you can do all of the normal stuff that you would want to do in your, uh, uh, in, your update, in your update process. Now, if you change React Native itself, if you want to ask for additional permissions, if you want to add some native library, then, of course, you still have to go through the App Store. But most updates are not like that. Uh, so you can delay. Uh, those updates, and for the most important stuff, you can do it immediately. So, uh, we, we launched, so let, let's see what this, uh, the results that we were able to achieve. Uh, we launched about uh, six months ago. We support both iOS 8 uh, and above and Android 4.1 and above. We've got about 100,000 installs. Uh, from our existing users. We didn't do any marketing, we just kind of nagged periodically, well, you can download an app if you really want to. And uh, we got about 15% of the sessions, daily sessions, uh, from the app. And reviews have been very good so far. Um, part, uh, part of the reason is, we think, is it's because it's uh, the, the, like the product, but we like the things that, I mean, the servers that we provide itself, but part of the reason is because the app itself is a better experience uh, than mobile for many use cases. Now, uh, we also, interesting uh, thing is 99.6% crash-free sessions. It, the actual figure is a bit lower if you count crash-free users, uh, but we think, we think sessions is a more like objective measure, and uh, you may or may not like it. We probably want to make it even better, but it's not, it's not too bad. Actually, our first versions was like 80% or something uh, while we were better testing it. But then you kind of uh, follow up on the bugs, you follow up on the performance issues, and uh, we updated React Native a bunch of times. And then slowly but steadily, we were able to get to this uh, hopefully good result. And uh, speaking of ratings, there is one rating that uh, I couldn't avoid sharing. I think it's great. It just arrived a, year, a week ago. It says, I didn't like the app, but I'll give you five stars for the effort. <laughs> so uh, thank you, anonymous uh, user. It was an effort indeed. And thank you, dear audience, for listening to me today. <laughs> thank you. Questions? Um, how much uh, do you share uh, uh, in terms of UI be, uh, between Android and iOS? Is it the same UI or, is it, or, or, it, or does it differ? Yeah, this was one of the go uh, good questions. Thank you. Because this was one of the original design goals, if you like. We wanted to share as much code as possible between the platforms. And with the exception of a few things where you have, for instance, uh, we get a unique instance ID, and there are different methods to do that on iOS and Android. So with the exceptions of things like that, almost all of the code uh, is shared across both platforms. 
And I, 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 can't, I don't have exact figure, but it will be definitely more than 95%. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>